I want to give a warm welcome to all of you joining today, joining us here today uh, at Gates Online Regional Seminar Series, the Intersex Bodies Global South Alliances, Africa. And before we begin our event, I'd like to just say a few words about the logistic, because in case you have any technical difficulties, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us in the chat and one of my colleagues will assist you. Uh, just quickly introducing myself. I am Vida Guzu, the chairperson for today's meeting. Uh, I'm an intersex travesty working as the intersex program officer here with GATE. And GATE, which is an international organization working towards the advancement of the human rights of trans and intersex people globally. And here from Brasilia, Brazil, I give you a warm welcome to all of you joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, your input on the debate. Uh, there is time reserved for our questions and answers round uh, at the end of the webinar. So please, in advance, feel free to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat and to submit any questions and comments you might have. I am really grateful for the exceptional opportunity to bring together here today African leaders I admire immensely and to own, I already thank in advance for their willingness, their readiness to accept the invitation. Um, for me and Gate, we it's very, very much important uh, that moment, that kind of encounter, uh, especially for intersex politics uh, and for intersex people, it's vital to foster alliances uh, between us uh, and talking about Global South even more because through political mobilization, we have found ways to survive in this life, in this time, and this space. So over the past few years, our way of being and resisting has gained more strength and momentum. Uh, in Africa, for example, uh, what we know all around the world, uh, ma many things has happened, have happened, uh, especially for us living in the low and middle income countries. Uh, we are suffering disproportionate impacts of many events and we are comfort we are facing the very necessity to provide forms of resisting uh, and Africa has a really really important history on on joining intersex fight for example on June 2019 intersex activists many of them gathered together here uh, founded the African Intersex Movement, a new network for, well, led by African intersex activists and sharing experiences regionally. Uh, more and more, the end of sex secret has been become our public issue. We have been building complex networks of alliances and articulating more alliances with brothers and sisters. So, we intersex people, our territories are challenges and possibilities, and we need very much encounters like that, spaces like that, uh, which are so rare for us and so very important for us. Uh, in that spirit, I have the honor to present uh, this webinar series uh, that which Gate is hosting to discuss trajectories of intersex-led movements in the Global South. And our purpose is to conduct a consultation process from a territory-based approach and from regional perspectives, since intersex groups in the Global South are far less likely to receive funding, to have access to community initiatives and regional and global entry points for policy and advocacy, uh, especially compared to those in the north. Uh, in spite of the our very, very small chances to survive, to uh, a very small chances of surviving, of persisting uh, individually or collective in the forms of groups, associations, 
uh, it brings me real joy to see the repressible obstinacy of this panel of speakers here today. The Latin America conference was the first in a series of three regional conferences, one for each major region of the Global South. And in our sec second iteration uh, of Intersex Bodies Global South Alliances, we have an activist from, from the African region. From West Africa, we, we welcome from Nigeria, Obioma, and from Ghana, Fafali. Um, from the Southern Africa subregion, uh, we we are happy to count with the presence with Mifaso from Zambia, Honzuz from Zimbabwe, if um, Crystal from South Africa, and coming from East Africa, we welcome James Kalanja from Kenya. So, uh, so to to begin. Well, first of all, Obioma, Fafali, Faso, uh, Ronnie, Crystal James, it's a great happiness to have you here. To begin our conversations here today, I would like to ask you um, to present yourselves uh, very briefly, and then we can start our conversation around some questions I prepared for us today. So thank you so much for being here today. I invite uh, Obioma to present, uh, to present uh, introduce uh, themselves and we start our conversation. Please go ahead uh, uh, between fr from one panelist to the other. Uh, you don't need to wait for me to call your name. Please present all yourselves and then we proceed to our first question. Thank you so much for being here. Obioma, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ida, and uh, thank you so much, Gates, for organizing this. Uh, my name is Obioma Chupike, and um, I'm greeting everybody attending this um, webinar today, wherever you are, morning, afternoon, evening. I hope you're having a great day. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and uh, I work with Intersex Nigeria. At Intersex Nigeria, um, we promote the visibility and recognition and inclusion of intersex persons here in Nigeria, and also stretch our center across regionally and internationally to support the work of intersex visibility, promotion, and recognition around various human rights issues and challenges that we face as intersex community. So I'm happy to be here with my colleagues from around Africa to discuss on these issues. Thank you so much. Uh, pass it on to Krista, who's next to me. Thank you, Obioma. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending where you're from. Uh, my name is Crystal Hendricks. I am the Intersex Rights Officer at Iranti. Um, Iranti is a regional organization that works on promoting the rights of intersex, trans, and LBQ persons. Um, Iranti is also the fiscal host of Intersex um, South Africa, an intersex organization in South Africa. So we work closely in partnership with Intersex South Africa. And most of our activities that we do, we, we do it jointly in a partnership to promote the rights of intersex people. Um, I will go to Mpatso. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, greetings to everyone, uh, wherever you're joining us from. It's a privilege to be here. And um, I would say my name is um, Paso Sakala from Zambia. And I work with an organization called Intersex Society of Zambia. Uh, Intersex Society of Zambia is a not-for-profit uh, intersex-led organization. And we basically exist uh, to facilitate for the recognition, protection and promote access to social, legal, political, spiritual and economic frameworks of intersex persons, as well as just looking into transforming them into well-informed, motivated and active individuals in order for them to live fulfilling lives, achieving their dreams, as well as uh, contributing to their communities in Zambia, regionally and uh, uh, globally. Um, I think I don't have uh, much to say, and I just want to take the opportunity to say uh, thank you to Gates for putting this together, and uh, thank you to the participants for joining and being able to find time to be part of this conversation. And to the panelists, I also say uh, thank you so much, and looking forward to 
uh, how our conversations go. So I'll pass it on to James Karanja. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. I am privileged to be here. I am James Karanja, the uh, current director of Intersex Person Society of Kenya. Intersex Person Society of Kenya is a grassroots nonprofit organization that aims at uh, creating awareness on intersex matters, advocating for the intersex welfare, their protection, and ensure that uh, they live in dignity, just like any other normal uh, citizen in uh, Kenya. Thank you. I pass it to Ronika. Sorry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where we all are. My name is Ronnie. Yes, Ronica is my name, but I do prefer Ronnie. Um, my pronouns are they, them. And um, I work with uh, the Intersex Community of Zimbabwe. That is a community-led organization uh, based in Zimbabwe. Um, ICOS in short. ICOS is a developmental intersex-led organization that is based in the community, initiated in 2018. We focus on intersex people in an environment where there is limited appreciation and acknowledgement of the existence, existence of intersex persons. Um, ICOS Trust um, works to promote identification, inclusion, integration, assimilation, of uh, human rights issues affecting intersex people in Zimbabwe. ICOS seeks to realize a society that is in appreciation of human rights, inclusive of intersex people, is a minority group appreciated, appreciated by the larger population. Um, our vision at ICOS is uh, to see intersex people thriving in all facets of life and uh, creating an environment where diversity and equality are key to human development. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the panelists. We have agreed to be part of this um, event and um, all the participants who are actually um, supporting us by being here to listen to us, as well as uh, thank Gate for creating this platform and this opportunity to have an intersex voice out there. So thank you very much. Um, and I should be passing this over to Feli. Thank you. Thank you very much and um, greetings to everyone. My name is Fafali and I work with Intercess Ghana. Intercess Ghana is a movement that um, consists of intercess activists who are working to get um, an end to the discrimination of intercess people and also protect their rights and create awareness and visibility around issues of intercess people. I also want to use this opportunity to thank Gates for organizing this and giving us the platform to share our experiences as intercess activists and also um, form alliances to be able to fight them um, against anti-gender movement that are pushing for the erasure of intercess people in the region. Thank you very much. Obiyama Fafali, Faso, Veroni, Crystal, James. So, so, so thank, many thanks for presenting yourselves. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your availability and interest in being here. Uh, Gate is very, very happy to have you here today. So to begin our conversations, I would like to propose some questions to guide our discussions. And this round, I would like to mainly ask you about past and present uh, experiences you have in your activism and in your territory. So uh, 
starting with Fafali. Uh, Fafali, I see, uh, I see you have a long history working towards intersex act, towards intersex equality, and I am sure you have many, many challenges. Uh, freedom of association, for example, is a huge challenge in Ghana. And uh, I, I researched you, have, you had some uh, troubles about it, about doing your activism uh, uh, last year, for example. So if you could please uh, share your experiences and your work on intersex activism and mainly the challenges you have regarding the freedom of association in Ghana, if you are comfortable with talking about it, like, or, of course. So Fafali, if you could please go ahead, we are looking forward to hear from you. All right, thank you very much, Mida. Um, yeah, um, for intersex activism in Ghana, um, our biggest or most difficult year was last year where um, during an a parallel section, we about 21 of our activists were arrested by the police and held for um, unlawful assembly. The charge was an unlawful assembly. And um, due to this, they were held, including myself, we were held um, in a police custody for 21 days. And uh, it was a, a great struggle out of that. Um, we came out to realize that um, the about eight parliament members also came out with a bill, which um, they have named the Promotion of Proper Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill 2021. And in that bill, um, it seeks to uh, violate the fundamental human rights of people, including intersex persons as well as intercess babies. And um, so as part of our activism, we put together a memorandum and we presented it before the parliament, parliamentary select committee, um, advocating that the bill should be entirely removed from the parliament because it stands against the fundamental human rights of people and also multiple human rights treaties and conventions. Um, so since then, we asked the, the case, the, the whole thing is still in parliament, and we are waiting to see how some of these things will be done. And in the meantime, we all are also um, doing a lot of awareness creation and sensitization among the intersex community to build their capacity and make them confident. And we are also looking at looking um, engaging with um, policy and advocacy um, change makers so that there can be changes in our policy and legal frameworks. And one of our major challenges has been um, with unavailability of funding or low funding towards issues of intersex people. And also um, there had not been, um, a lot of data is not available in our context on the number of people who are born intersex in the country, the number of people who have undergone um, coerced and um, forceful surgical corrections we don't have enough in, um, information on some of these things and it makes working around these things very difficult because without data you wouldn't be able to engage legal and policy makers um, effectively to be able to present your case so so far these are some of the things we have been going through in Ghana and however we are not relenting in our efforts we continue to do our advocacy work and we are believing that um, with opportunities like this for us to come together as an, a global south um, activist we would be able to um, push our challenges forward and then we can be able to um, link up with other African countries who have been able to make some few uh, um, progress in terms of uh, changes in their legal framework so that we can be able to adopt some of the strategies they used in our, their advocacy work to be able to get to how far they have gotten to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fafali, for your answer. I'd like to proceed um, to Mifaso um, from Zambia, Sakala, uh, from Zambia, Mifaso Sakala. 
uh, we are aware of recent developments in Zambian politics around um, poli um, political mobilization on LGBTI rights. And uh, Mifaso, you have such an interesting historic on interacting with national and international organizations. Uh, so you have a multi-level engagement on, on raising awareness on intersex issues. So I'd like to, to ask you to talk a little bit about uh, your history of engagement and about recent developments on intersex uh, on, uh, in intersex politics in Zambia. Uh, please be fast, so go ahead, the floor is yours. We can't hear you, Mifaso. So sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead, awesome. Mifaso. Welcome awesome. here. We are looking forward to hear from you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, starting with uh, just sharing my uh, experience with activism, um, I'm not that <laughs> old in activism. I just started activism in 2017, but uh, like you rightly put it, I've been able to engage at national level, regional level, as well as um, uh, the global level. So um, before I come to the recent happenings which are, which are going on in the country, I'll just uh, quickly uh, share the experience and also just the struggles in terms of what, are the, uh, how, what have been the challenges um, uh, doing uh, intersex advocacy. So when we look at how um, intersex issues are looked at, especially from the context of uh, Africa, and I'll uh, limit my, um, my scope of uh, reference to, to, to Zambia, you see that um, the barriers to uh, intersex uh, challenges uh, uh, coming from um, culture, traditions, uh, religious beliefs before it even touches on, on the issues of uh, uh, politics. So you find that how intersex issues are looked at, even when we look at how we are doing our work, that has been a challenge on its own. And why am I saying so? You find that um, norms uh, of society also, they, they are more like um, a guide on how society is supposed to, to conduct uh, itself. And when we look at how intersex issues were treated, you'll find that um, issues around like myths and misconceptions we normally talk about, those issues are real. So you find that the way intersex issues are perceived, you find that they'll tell you it's a case, it's a bad omen. If you come to the religion aspect of it, they will tell you you're yeah, demon possessed. Just being labeled like that um, also presents uh, more room for stigma and discrimination to the extent where we've had experiences uh, where intersex persons have been killed uh, because we're talking about infanticide at an early uh, uh, stage after birth intersex children are killed because of, of of those issues so i find that even as we are doing our work now that still uh, continues to be a challenge and the other thing aside from that is the issues of uh, data. So you find that if we look at data and what our constitution says about intersex people, it's very silent. In the first place, I would say it doesn't recognize intersex people. So when it comes to policy, it's very difficult to find policy which talks to uh, or which is inclusive of uh, intersex persons. So that also presents a challenge. And Again, if we look at uh, because they are not uh, recognized, it poses a challenge for us activists uh, in terms of how do we then engage uh, governments because at the same time, we don't have data. And most of the time, you find that when you go to policymakers, you go to stakeholders, they'll ask you, where is the data? So that in itself, you look at uh, when we are working, data is a challenge because there's lead to, I would even say there's no research done on intersex people. As it stands, we don't know how many intersex births uh, we've had. We don't know how intersex persons even are treated in the, in the hospitals. 
So that in itself, those are some of the challenges uh, we are going through here in Zambia as activists. And um, the challenge is huge. And also when we look at how do we do our work, honestly speaking, every one of us needs resources. But if we look at how um, access to resources has been for intersex-led organizations, be it in Africa, I would even say the global south, it has been very difficult. Because I think for me, uh, I can even say we don't have funding, but I, I would take the opportunity to even just uh, add more flesh to that. When we look about, uh, when we talk about funding, I think we've experienced, I, I'm sure my fellow activists will agree with me where we've seen calls for, uh, for applications, but you find that none of intersex uh, organizations are funded. So as another challenge, when we are doing activism, we find that in as much as in country, we have a big knowledge gap, it also extends to donors. And I can comfortably say that donors do not understand our, our work as intersex uh, uh, activists. And maybe the reason could be that um, when we look at the, the whole issues around uh, advocates around minority groups, in this case, I'll talk about the LGBTI, we are seen like a homogeneous group, which is very wrong because each and everyone of us, because when you talk about the LGBTI, those are different distinct groups with different needs in as much as there may be other intersectionalities around any other thing, because when you talk about access to water, access to what, but you find that the fact that we've been lumped like more like a homogeneous group, this is where you find that even intersex persons are being, uh, they find themselves in a space where they are being criminalized, yet, you find that there's even no law to speak to, 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 to these issues. So these are, are challenges. So uh, lumping intersex issues together in terms of seeing us as a homogeneous group, that also, I think from my end, it has um, brought us a lot of uh, 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 challenges. And just briefly talking about what is happening here, it uh, borders on what I've just uh, presented in terms of seeing us as a homogeneous group and mostly I think the issue is about politicizing our issues. That is it, uh, another challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mifaso, for your considerations. Um, you have mentioned some funding raising issues and I'd like to invite Crystal Hendricks for, from South Africa. Uh, Crystal, ha you have some experiences uh, offering cons um, well consulting um, for fundraisers, for donors and funders. Uh, and how can uh, my question is in your activism, how can we politicize, as Mafaso said, our uh, funding raising, how to mobilize, mobilize uh, donors in favor of intersex? Uh, issues. Well, could you please um, tell us a, a little bit of your experiences on that? Hi, everyone. Welcome again. And like, I think that it's really tough, like, you know, having <clears throat> these conversations um, because just listening to the, the lived realities of intersex people on the African continent, right? And it, it really, it takes you to a place where um, you realize how much support is still required and, and needed um, for the intersex um, community, um, not only in Africa, but in the entire global South, right? Like, as most of us are aware that intersex people are still one of the most marginalized groups um, in society. Um, and because of this, it, it has further social and economic impacts on their lives, right? Intersex people, are one of the most vulnerable groups, especially in Africa, where um, there's been so much discrimination towards intersex people that as intersex people, um, they do not have access to employment. They don't have access to housing. They don't have 
access to health care. Um, they don't have access to simple basic things like water and sanitation and, you know, just to just to live their daily lives and just to exist. And, and, and amongst all of these issues that they are facing, um, they are also facing that them not having autonomy and self-determination over their body. And, and because of this, like Mpatsu just said, sometimes they feel that, you know, um, donors sometimes don't understand us. And when we think about that, we really have to think about all the multilateral organizations and donors, like should really look at restructuring, like how they fund and also bring intersex people onto the conversation um, when we talk uh, about about funding, right? I think for the longest time, intersex people um, globally has never received like, you know, more than 2% of the global fund that is available. And most intersex groups, especially speaking from an African perspective, are only funded by one or two donors. And these are small grants of between $5,000 and $10,000. And, you know, if you are really fortunate, you, you can get more funding. But the problem with that as well is that all the, the, the strict rules and the requirements of these proposals are sometimes just not accessible um, to intersex people. Um, when we're looking at the small marginalized community that, especially in Africa, has really been active um, in raising their voices only since, you know, in the, in the late 2017s. Before that, yes, there was intersex activism and there was activists that was visible and open, but we saw a growth in the movement um, from 2017. And, and all these activists are literally running organizations with zero with zero budgets, you know, and some on a budget of five to ten thousand dollars a year and doing all this amazing work. And and it just leaves me to think that, you know, if donors can think of how can we restructure our funding to actually include intersex people, how can we support intersex people through our granting process, through our um, proposal writing process, you know, what interventions, what training can we do to support the intersex community in order for them to grow you know I feel like as an intersex person coming into this movement and looking at a 20 page proposal it's very intimidating you know where do we find the words where do we find the language um, as people from the global south everything about intersex has been so westernized right and you see the, the the north having all this power and all of this authority that that nothing is really made simple and and easy um for intersex people from you know really um dire backgrounds to come forward and say, hey, I, I am available to do this work, but I just need help and I need support. And, you know, and the conversation around um, capacity strengthening and capacity building, you know, it's always be, being thrown around. But when it comes down to it, people want intersex people to talk about their love dualities. Like society is more in, interested in the violations that intersex people faces and the trauma that they go through their lives because they want to sensationalize our stories, right? Sometimes our stories is, is what makes them interest about. They forget that we as intersex people have different intersectional identities and there's many things um, that, that affects us. And But yet these conversations are not having with us when intersex people are invited in a room, it's share your story. And intersex people always have to love their trauma, relive their trauma and you know just see their, their, their bodies being put on this public display and you know we, we go to this with the medical fraternity and now when we come to conversations with donors you still need to have the same conversation regarding your body and I feel that's something that that needs to stop and there needs to be interventions of how can we restructure funding for intersex people that not only makes it accessible but that makes it simple and that makes it easy and that's the only way we're going to actually grow this movement in the global south if we have that necessary support Thank you so much, Vida. Thank you so much, Crystal. I really hope we can we can have more and more uh, opportunities to mobilize Global South. And uh, love when you mentioned uh, there is no way people see our history, our our living narratives, and uh, well, and keep. Uh, the same and keeping and there is no way we founders see our histories and couldn't uh and, and they couldn't uh sensitive have some sensitivity about it because 
the, our histories, our narratives are very potential. Are very pot, uh, they have the potential to, to mobilize feelings and I hope more money, more finance, finance uh, financing for our, our our for our issue for our fight for our movements. So next, uh, I would like to invite Ronnie Zuzi from Zimbabwe. Uh, Ronnie, you 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 well founded the intersex community of Zimbabwe in two thousand eighteen, right? And uh, well. I well it you received uh, some funding from the international uh, intersex fund. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about how it has been uh, since 2018. How uh, has well intersex politics in Zimbabwe uh, been developed since 2018 when you are when you founded the community of Zimbabwe. Uh, and please, the challenges, the you know, biggest challenges you have faced, uh, especially on funding uh, issues. Uh, uh, well, that's it, uh, Ronnie. That's my main question to you. Welcome here today. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, please go ahead, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Vida. Um, um, and thank you so much for that very important question. Um, I think since 2018, uh, when we funded uh, the intersex community of Zimbabwe, um, we have been privileged to be funded in the very next year in 2019 because we were funded towards the end of 2019. 2018. So 2019, we were privileged to receive some funding. Um, it was a very small amount of funding, which was 2,500 US dollars uh, for us to operate since it was the first time for, for, for the whole year. So um, it was very challenging to be able to manage that kind of a small amount uh, throughout the year. And yet, be able to produce the kind of work that we did produce. But I, I, I think what I can say is that with um, passion, um, dedication, perseverance, and um, everything that it takes for us to want to uh, fight for our own rights, uh, we have seen um, our group um, uh, the intersect community of Zimbabwe rising um, and uh, being more visible and being able to achieve the things that we have achieved up to today. Uh, basically, when it comes to uh, intersex politics in Zimbabwe, I think um, I should start sharing in um, um, on the context of um, the culture of um, secrecy and silence. That carries um, that is carried out when an intersex child is born. Um, yes, of course, uh, as in many African countries in the global south, we know that when a child, when an intersex child is born, in most cases they are killed, um, and if they are like, lucky to survive, there is so much secrecy. And sometimes you might find that that child might not even get a chance to even go to school. So that is the context of most um, African countries in the, in the global south. So looking at that context, it hasn't been very easy for us to be able to, um, to be very visible because most intersex people, they prefer to, um, to live in their in their isolation because they fear, because also because of the political situation here in Zimbabwe where um, LG, the, the whole of like LGBTI community is criminalized by the laws of the country. Um, it is very difficult to find intersex people 
who are already a minority of a, of a, of a minority group to see them coming out. So most of the work that we have been doing, you would find that over the years since 2018, there have been mostly two or three intersex people who are quite visible and trying to fight and fundraise with very little experience, very, very little resources. Um, but I think with um, perseverance and, um, and, and, and resilience, um, given the fact that even um, we even go through um, uh, issues whereby we are, we, we are intimidated um, by, by security agents and um, we still continue to fight. So basically you would find that um, in, especially during COVID, we, 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 we lost a donor um, who was actually part of our, um, our pro programmatic um, uh, programs. So at the end of the day, you'd find that um, there are a lot of issues that are going, that are going on with most um, intersex um, groups within the, the, global, the global South. So it is very, very difficult but um, you'd find that uh, most um, intersex groups, they are just uh, operating uh, out of passion and uh, they are under, understaffed. And we have actually seen that simply because of that, there are now issues of um, most intersex activists uh, giving up. Sometimes they come, they join the movement, but then sometimes simply because of um, uh, little resources, they end up getting bent out and they they leave the uh, the work uh, so thank you very much thank you so much Rani, for uh, your comments on on well on the work you have done uh, you mentioned some uh, you mentioned intersex isolation and so sorry i just realized i hadn't uh, well now i will repeat so ronnie you mentioned intersex isolation and invisibility and also the additional impact covid had additional and disproportionate impact covid had uh in need and over us intersex people. And Obioma, uh, I know you have uh, some experience uh, research intersex uh, communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to ask you to, well, give us some a, a few words about it and about the work you have done uh, in Nigeria with um, the, the organization you founded, Intersex Nigeria. Please welcome uh, here on uh, Obioma. I have to have you. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Vida. Um, so let me start with the work we do at Intersex Nigeria before I move over to the COVID, because I would like to round up with that. So at Intersex Nigeria, um, we founded Intersex Nigeria in 2019 because of the great invisibility of intersex community here in Nigeria within the LGBTQI community. Because prior before I founded Intersex Nigeria, I had worked with an LBQ organization. And in that process, I realized the great invisibility and lack of understanding that is even within the LGBTQI community here in Nigeria, I discovered that we are actually left behind. And that was one of the reasons that pushed the founding of Intercess Nigeria, because I realized that if we don't start it, nobody will do it for us, because you have to first of all project yourself before someone else can assist and support you. So, um, and at Intercess Nigeria, since we started in 2019, with the help of um, funders like Astria and Frida, who were the first to come on board with us to support us uh, with the funding that we got, even though it was small, but it was very impactful. We were able to start organizing, start um, sensitizing and creating awareness. And that awareness, I must tell you, has actually um, 
created a lot of visibility within Nigeria around intersex, not just within the LGBTQI organizing, but outside the LGBT organizing, a lot of people are actually looking and searching and trying to understand what is intersex. For example, this year in March, uh, one of the top questions that was asked in Google in Nigeria is what is intersex? So this is one of the impact that what we have been doing have actually brought to light. A lot of people are now like waking up to like, what is happening? What, what are these people trying to say? And a lot of people have this misunderstanding that intersex is a gender identity before now. And now they have realized that sex characteristics is another part of what people can be naturally. So um, this is one of the things that we have tried to do at Intersex Nigeria. And that's not alone. We have also tried to build a community because we have come to realize that intersex people some don't even know that they are intersex, but when we begin to share information and when we begin to make them understand that some of the things that they have experienced, because most times you find that they are intersex when you go through a test or maybe in dream fertility or maybe something has happened and you coincidentally you find out that you are intersex, except possibly you have the physical variation, which we know that is not all intersex persons have physical variations. So um, I would say that knowledge sharing information and access to accurate information just, not just to the public, but within the community is something that we have been doing. And we have also been doing a lot of stakeholder engagement because we believe that if we're going to do a lot of advocacy, recognition and visibility for the community, we have to start from the bottom top. And when I mean from the bottom top, we have to start from the grassroots, the local stakeholders, because these are the people that relate to the communities. The people at the higher you know, strata don't really understand what the community is going it is, uh, is passing through. And if we want to talk to people around what intersex is, intersex community is actually passing through, we have to like go to the grassroots, let the stakeholders know. And the feedback that we have been having have been positive. A lot of stakeholders are putting it on themselves that they want to carry this message and they want to work with us, they want to support us. And I know that people might ask, how did you do this? How is it possible for you to try to convince stakeholders to join you in this course? The thing that we do is power of storytelling. We have used the power of storytelling to actually let people know that intersex people exist here in Nigeria and we have been discriminated. We are still being killed and we are still being stigmatized. And there's a lot of sensitization that needs to happen, a lot of awareness, a lot of collaborations, and a lot of partnerships. So these are some of the things that Intercess Nigeria has been doing. It hasn't come with an easy price because just like all of my colleagues have shared, capacity is a, is a huge issue within the intersex movement, not just in Africa. We are experiencing a lot of capacity relapse and we are trying our best, but we, we wish there was more that could be done for us to have more capacity, not just organizational, but also some skills that we need to be able to you know, do proper advocacy and also um, other socioeconomic and the community building and wellness, well-being programs that we, 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 we want to do at Intercess Nigeria. Then coming to COVID, in 2020, when COVID started heavily and um, the, inter the global intercess movement taught it that they need to understand the context of different situations of intercess people around the continent. So I jumped into that and I decided to do the one for um, Africa. And doing that um, research and a survey, the report that came out from it was very, very enormous because we found out that a lot of intercess people have been isolated. They have lacked access to access to healthcare services and uh, provision. And also they have been stigmatized and violated by family members because of the lockdown that have been experienced in different parts of Africa. So these are just some of the things that the findings uh, mentioned in that uh, in that study. And also one of the big things that came out of it is that there are no proper healthcare providers who understand our body and can provide services for us here in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abiyama. I know time wasn't enough to um, talk about COVID, but I hope we can get back to it later. Uh, well, Abiyama, you mentioned some, well, how it's important to uh, our interaction with grassroots. Um, but on the other hand, we also have the history of interacting with state institutions. And well, for example, uh, Kenya has 
such a creative history of interacting with state institutions. And I would like to ask James Caranja to, to talk, to, to speak a few words about how, it, how about to describe the intersex politics in Kenya. We are aware there have been some, there have been recent developments uh, and we, well, I, I know there is a, for example, a government of Kenya Intersex Committee since 2019. So I'd like to, uh, to ask you to say a few words about the, uh, about the history of, the, of your activism, of, uh, of uh, your activism in Kenya, and especially about your interaction with state institutions. So welcome, uh, welcome James. We are really happy to have you here. So the floor is yours, please go ahead. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think for us as Intersex Persons Society of Kenya came at the right time. I'm saying at the right time doesn't mean that there were no issues at hand. Um, for us was that um, we had a legal framework that was already laid uh, by powerful uh, non-governmental organizations that were interested um, in conducting or ensuring that people who were incarcerated were treated with dignity and they had one intersex person. I think from there, the judiciary took over. And when the judiciary took over, they realized that there was a need or that there's a group uh, or a category that was not acknowledged by the system. Understanding that probably 99% of intersex issues goes against the um, norm or the established existing um, systems. These may be by the government or by the social um, paradigms. So that is where the judiciary thought that they needed to have um, a, um, a few issues that needed to be addressed by the executive. So that led to formation of um, um, an intersex committee, the 2017 one. Then from there, we had the 2019 one. So dealing with a government on one hand, it sounds to be very enticing, but on the other hand, we must remember that these are some of the people or these are the institutions that always deny us the, um, the very same rights we are fighting. So it's having oppressor and the oppressed on the same table uh, trying to purport to be moving on one direction. By the end of the day, one is drilling the process. So for the intersex people, it has not been easy, but um, as Obioma uh, said, our stories, um, the use of media, I think the biggest, um, Oh, the catalyst that has led us to be where we are and the government taking over on intersex issues, the biggest catalyst has been the media because through, um, lived, through telling our lived realities in the public domain, then the government uh, will always be answerable to the um, uh, population or to the citizens. And therefore they felt that um, there was need to have intersex issues um, taken care of. So basically it has not been easy, but at the end of the day, we appreciate um, because if you look where we are compared to our other country uh, members or, or other members in Africa, we would be categorized as the most progressive, although there's still a lot that need to be done. Thank you so much, James. Um, let me just stop the timer. Well, before we go to, to the second round of questions, as we started late, I would like to kindly ask participants if you are okay with staying on for an additional 10 to 15 minutes to address some Q&A uh, and well, and I mentioned it also to so so attendees also could know we run on a bit longer. If that's okay for the panelists, uh, I wait for your answers in the chat. So gathering some consideration that well, gathering the considerations you you speakers brought today in the in that first round of questions. I would like to, to proceed to another question on 
how to how can we address recent challenges in the global south uh, i i mean we we have there have been some pretty um bad um, developments uh trying to withdraw hard won rights and well some really really great resistance from government and society about our our issue our fight so how to how can we address challenges like the democratization like anti lgbti and anti gender actors on uh, the race of conservatism and neoliberalism and also COVID-19, which had impacted, had, had which exacerbated uh, even more our challenges, especially our health uh, challenges regarding health access. So please, I would like to invite uh, Fafali to say a few words about it. Please, Fafali, we are looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much, Bida, for the opportunity. Um, even though there has been some level of um, visibility and awareness creation about intersex people in the global south, there has also been some few challenges when it comes to um, anti-gender movement or um, conservatives groups um, who have always been pushing for laws and um, because they have the notion that sex is supposed to be binary and also um, because of some of the myths and misinformations and misconceptions around intersex issues. And they have been advocating and pushing for um, harmful laws and bills to erase the existence of intersex people and uh, infringe on our fundamental human rights. Um, some of the things that we can do as a global south uh, activism movement uh, would be to gather some factual and accurate data on the intersex community and our needs in terms of uh, research data collection and also organizing situational analysis on the realities of intersex people by doing audiovisual um documentaries to um, create awareness more awareness and support for the intersex community and also, um, you can see that in the sub region, um, uh, there had not been a very strong and vibrant intercess movement. So, if we can be able to come together as activists in the global south to form a more formidable uh, intercess movement, then we will be able to advocate and push for the um, policies and legal frameworks that would, in one way or the other, and back the fact that intersex people exist and their struggles are real and they are also supposed to um, enjoy their civil rights as well as their social economic rights should be um, actualized. You also, uh, when you look at uh, Kenya, they have been able to make some um, progressive gains in terms of advocacy for intersex, um, the stop of intersex uh, genital mutilations and also a recognition that intersex is a third gender. And if we can have opportunities and fundings to be able to exchange knowledge from um, some of these countries, to be able to change the narratives in the contents of our other countries that are yet to achieve such advocacy uh, at tools and strategies, we can learn from these people and use their approaches and also achieving our collective goal and will also give us the platform to be able to sort of um, look at their strategies, look at the tools and the approaches that they use to be able to have strategic engagement with our policy makers in the health and human rights sectors. This will go a long way to um, give us a strong grounding as an intercess movement in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you for filing. Uh, well, Obioma, could you please uh, uh, keep the conversation going on West Africa and well, the sub-region uh, challenges and how to, to face uh, 
well intersex ch the challenges posed to intersex people thank you well um talking about nigeria and west africa i want to say that if you look at the intersex organizing in africa you'll find out that uh, the southern part and the east have made a lot of progress especially the southern part of africa have made a lot of progress in uh, organizing not actually like achieving a lot but visibility is actually achieving a lot. But when you come to West Africa, West Africa is still um, trying to, it's not like there are no intersex persons here in West Africa. It's not like there's no intersex activists or people that can do the work, but because they, are, they haven't been enough you know, support. I would say I will use the word support and because support is kind of large. Like for instance, language is one of the barriers that we face here in, West Africa, because my colleagues from the Francophone are always left out when you're talking about intercess organizing here in Africa. I've had a lot of uh, intercess persons from um, either Cameroon or um, um, Burkina Faso, you know, reaching out to me and even Ivory Coast reaching out to me and saying, oh, how do they do this? How are we going to do that? And I try as much as possible to, you know, engage with them. But you notice that the language barrier always becomes an issue and it becomes like there's no frequent communication. They really want to do a lot, but how are they going to start doing it? It's always like, you know, when someone speaks your language, it's easy for you to just talk about it and get it going. But when there's always a need for someone to interpret for you and, you know, the conversation sometimes is not flowing and it can be, you know, tiring, you know, but one thing I know that we can look at is how we can, you know, necess not necessarily form like a network, but how we can help our colleagues, our, you know, family over there in other countries in West Africa to begin to do what they want to do because a lot of them want to organize. You might, you might not have heard of a lot of intersex activists in West Africa, but I know about three of them that's in different parts of um, West Africa that are trying to do something really good. But language is actually a challenge, but one of the, one of the challenges that is um, language. Another challenge is funding. Most of them don't even have the capacity to manage the fund and they don't even have the funding. But I know that having the capacity to manage the fund is something that can happen easily if there is a if there is support from not just um, not just from the other countries um, around, but from other people that are doing something similar in organizing. Another thing that we can do, speaking about. Um, creating more visibility in Africa and coming down to West Africa is if we can actually do like a cross learning. Cross learnings are very, very important because when you look at what your counterparts are doing and how they are doing it, you can be able to know how to do better. So I think we also need to do a lot of cross learning and we also have to do a lot of collaborations and also how the international community can spotlight intersex issues and challenges in their different thematic areas because i always believe that support is very necessary when people are trying to bring out and speak up if there are no support it looks like they are left alone we need a lot of support from the international bodies both the donors both the human rights organizations that are doing a lot of mechanisms to address some of these issues so these are some of the things i think that we can do to create a lot of you know proper and increased visibility in west africa and even in the north the not looks like nothing is happening there, but there are still people there who want to do something. But how are they going to do it is where the challenge comes, comes in place. And I believe that what um, my counterpart said earlier that we also have to start looking at how we can synergize well here in Africa to be able to help each other to stand because if we're able to help each other, because if I didn't get the support I got when we are starting Intercess Nigeria, I don't think we would, we'll be able to you know, grow as we have done. So I think support is what we can do for each other. Thank you. Thank you, Obioma. Uh, next, I'd like to, to ask Crystal to uh, say a few words on how does she see the future of intersex activism in in South Africa and especially on South Horn Africa? Uh, what differences do you see, Crystal, between what our previous um, panelists said and your analysis and your perspectives 
for South Africa intersex politics and the future of intersex politics in your country. Uh, thank, thank you, Vida, and thank you, Vioma, and thank you, um, Fafali, for speaking so eloquently. Um, yeah, I think it's really both like, as everybody is aware, when we speak about South Africa, we speak about the country um, that has one of the most progressive constitutions, right, um, that's supposed to protect all humans. Um, however, we see that this is still not enough to protect intersex people and the violations um, that they face within this country. Um, in South Africa, um, we have Act 49 of 2003, which is our Sex Descriptors Act, which actually allows intersex people um, to change their legal gender marker. However, the, the process is so pathologizing that you need to prove um, <laughs> you need to prove who you are, which is really ridiculous, right? And when when we think about this, like we literally took the similar policy that that they have in the UK um, regarding legal gender recognition, and we are now telling it to six people: in order for you to change your legal gender marker, you need to provide medical reports, you know, to say that you are intersex. You need to provide medical reports that you've been living in a certain gender for a certain amount of years. You need to provide evidence from your community, and like the list is on. Going so so yes, there's a policy um for intersex people, but the, the policy is so pathologizing that intersex people just don't have access um to to the policy. Um, and when we think about intersex genital mutilation, like South Africa has so many um progressive laws when it comes to to children's rights. However, there's nothing that that mentions intersex people. Um, in 2019, um, there was an opportunity to make an addition to the Children's Bill of Rights which the intersex um, organizations made additions and said, we need intersex genital mutilation to be named and we need a child to, to be able to give consent and have bodily autonomy. And yet when we look at these um, 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 documents that's released within this year, 2022, there's no mention of intersex people. So yes, a country that's not criminalized, a country that has progressive constitutions, but still does not care about intersex people. and. Globally, I mean, globally, we have this problem, right? How many countries bans IGM? I think we can count them on our on our ten fingers, you know. So it, it, it's we can understand that that globally, there's there's still this um, thing that's happening where intersex people are tortured, you know. Intersex people are um, people choose to conform as to a certain box, and I think we also had the thing about a, a third gender, and it's so confusing. And I know everybody understands things differently, but we also need to ensure that um, our states, our governments, our communities, our societies understand that being intersex is not a third gender. It's linked to sexual characteristics, and I think there's a great opportunity um, for us to really um, have education out there and awareness. I feel like as an intersex person, you cannot create enough awareness. I feel I'm gonna give my second name awareness because I feel that how much awareness that we raise about intersex people and about intersex lived realities, people still do not, I think people choose not to understand intersex people. People choose not to understand the violations that intersex people go through because I feel it makes it easier for them to turn a blind eye and not focus on people that are having their human rights completely stripped away from us. Um, within South Africa, we are definitely starting a process of litigation regarding intersex genital mutilation, um, because we feel at this point, like, you know, we've advocated, we've raised awareness, and yet our government still do not listen to intersex people and do not acknowledge that intersex people exist. And these mutilations are happening within our public and private health sector. Therefore, it's important that intersex people also use the law to their advantage. And, and that's something in South Africa that we are doing by collecting statements and affidavits from intersex people to start a, a process of actually um, litigate against intersex genital mutilation and have it being called unlawful within South Africa. And I feel like if, if this process, if we can start this process and be successful, like Obioma said, it's so important that we share best practice across countries, that we can support each other, and that we can help in that, help one another. And also with the movement that, that's happened in Kenya, it's so important and so vital for the intersex community. You know, we we, have, we need to have a start. And if the, if the start um, is there, it's important for us to latch on and to say, like, look what the government is doing in Kenya. They are listening to intersex people, and they, they 
are putting laws in place that will actually penalize someone, that will actually find someone, that can actually jail someone um, for performing non-consensual surgeries on a child. So I think it's, it's an important start for Africa and we should just keep moving from this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, well, about Southern Africa, Ronnie, could you please uh, include your considerations about Zimbabwe uh, and what do you envision for the future of intersex people in Zimbabwe in terms of priorities, upcoming opportunities, and also intersex organizing mobilization, please? Thank you once again, Vida. I think my vision for my country in terms of intersex organizing would be to see um, a strong intersex representation whereby uh, there are more uh, intersex persons, you know, um, becoming visible. And this can only be possible if we, um, I, I would like to concur with one of my colleagues who talks about issues of um, capacity and also in terms of like um, more resources, uh, because it's very difficult for us to even convince um, our fellow intersex persons to join the cause if they are not uh, realizing any, any growth, any positive impacts. Um, and also, I think uh, in terms of capacity, I think we also need to understand how the law, um, like maybe international um, international laws work in our favor to understand that, just to have that capacity or even our own uh, national laws, um, just to have that understanding of how we can use it to our, our advantage that includes issues of uh, maybe the SDGs and all the available um, laws and structures that are available for us to utilize. But then in, in, instead, but here is as of here in Zimbabwe, but the other thing that we have been realizing again is that um, there is also this issue of um, language that is that we, we should be using that can also be restricted, um, such that many people who are even willing to join the movements, they, they get scared to even attempt to, 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 join, um, to join the work inter intersex activism, simply because they feel that it's so intimidating. Um, I, I think in that context, um, for here in Zimbabwe, that would be something that I envision to see um, more of that happen in terms of um, um, capacitating um, more of uh, intersex activists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Mifaso, would you, Mifaso from Zambia, would you have additional thoughts to share on Southern Africa and also Zambia or Zambia's future? you envision for the intersex people in your country and in the region? Okay, I think before I lose my thoughts, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to my fellow panelists uh, as well. I think before I lose my thought, I think in terms for the intersex uh, people here in Zambia is that, uh, for me, I'm looking forward to a Zambia where the rights of uh, intersex persons are upheld by all. And in terms of just the additions uh, to what my colleagues have um, uh, uh, presented, I think I would like to echo that um, language is very critical in the work we do, not just in terms of um, language as in um, the tribe. I would also just touch on the terminologies I think also when we look at terminologies, they've also impacted intersex persons' lives. For example, the use of the word hermaphrodite, because that has also shaped the narrative which we have today that intersex persons are born with two organs, which is not actually you know, a true reflection of who an intersex uh, uh, person is. And also I would like to echo on um, 
uh, what uh, my fellow uh, panelists have also presented in terms of uh, uh, organizing. I think uh, at this point, we accept that uh, we need more capacity to be built within uh, intersex activists and cross-learning. If we see the, there's been different, you know, um, positives which are being seen in different countries. And I believe that if we can have cross-learning, we should be able to also just be able to capacitate ourselves and be able to learn how uh, our colleagues in different uh, parts of um, Africa are, are also um, uh, doing their advocacy. And also, um, when we look at how, um, when we look at intersex uh, issues and also how we've struggled as, as intersex activists actually to do our work, support is very important even just within uh, ourselves. And maybe just to add on, I think that would be my last uh, point in terms of what are the opportunities. I think for me, the opportunities is cross-learning. I think there, is, uh, there are things we can learn from each other. And the other things is um, uh, also maybe just uh, um, incorporating issues uh, like SDGs, riding on uh, national uh, strategic plans in order to also uh, be able to, to advocate for inclusion of intersex persons. And as I conclude overall, I think uh, visibility is very important. We may be facing a lot of challenges, uh, but if we uh, have more visibility and also uh, raise awareness on our issues. I think with time, change is gradual and uh, not everyone, uh, we are not quick to accept uh, change. So as we keep on pushing in terms of doing our advocacy, I'm sure at some point people will, will be able to learn and be able to, to understand the issues and be able to work with us and be able to support us in our, yeah, in our, in our work. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mifaso. I'd like to ask James Corinja from Kenya to say a few words about the same topic. Please, James, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Um, I think for me, I would just want to uh, say that we must understand that a modern society, a modern state, um, reflects or it's reflected on the laws and the policies that it has uh, in place to, go to govern its people. So the most important thing for us as uh, the intersex community, we need to learn to occupy some of those spaces. Um, and that can be brought around by uh, um, what we term as um, learning the best, the best practices from each other within uh, the African region. And at some time or at some point within the global South, uh, we need to create a lot of visibility around intersex issues because um, Within the African context, most of these issues are all political connected. So, and the political goodwill drives us the, some of these policies. So we must learn or we must look from that perspective of getting to these spaces where some of these issues are discussed. Um, the other thing probably would be, we need to work to get more resources because without more resources means less capacity and less representation. So those are some of the things that we should be looking forward as the intersex community around uh, the global south to advance intersex issues. Thank you so much, James, for your answer. Um, so before we go to, before we proceed to, to an end, I would like to, uh to take a few questions from the from the chat if you are okay with it um first question i'd like to to transmit to the panelists are is from Tariq from the elton john aids foundation uh who asked who has asked it where and how donors should direct and prioritize funding to best support intersex communities. Well, Tariq is questioning about uh, how donors could 
uh, make a decision on how to pri prioritize intersex funding. Uh, I believe Crystal would be uh, a good fit to that question, but please go ahead and any, any other panelists uh, interested in, in answer it. Hi, Vida. <laughs> I'll definitely go ahead, but anybody can jump in. Hi, Tariq. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, that's it's really a great question. I think if we um, think of, um, you know, the views um, regarding prioritizing funding for intersex communities, um, you know, intersex communities, most of them are working voluntary. Me, myself, I was working full time for five years and I was volunteering all my weekends um, to do intersex work because of there being no funding in intersex work. I think donors should really think about providing intersex groups with core funding, you know, core funding just so they can put in place structures in their organizations like work plans, like strategic plans, um, because what we are seeing in the community is that intersex groups are getting a lot of project or program related funding, um, which leaves little um, for salaries or for volunteers or any office support. Um, even human resources, policies, procedures, like many small intersex groups struggle to obtain this information because the, the funding are so strict based on programmatic and they will basically be stressing to, to produce this project that the funding was for, but then also lacking within themselves personally because some intersex people cannot afford um, to pay themselves if the funding is directly related to project funding. So I feel donors should really engage um, with people, especially um, where our lives are criminalized as well. Like many people have spoken, we, we're hearing about Ghana, about the new bill um, being launched that's directly against advocacy. We're seeing what Mpatso is saying in Zambia with the with the rise of the anti-LGBTI um, community. So there's many struggles that intersex people face and sometimes they just need to be supported. But but if we have donors that are coming to intersex people with this um, program funding and say we need you to implement this program or this program, what is left for intersex people to just exist on and, and, and just to live on and make sure that they get paid for this work that they are doing? Because the intersex community is doing the most, right? They're always advocating, they're always working, but most of these people are volunteers. And at the end of the day, um, People need to feed themselves, they need to feed their families, they need to support, you know, just, just their life. So donors should really look at how they can support intersex groups with core funding that gives them some autonomy on how to plan their projects, how to plan their programs, and how to just set up the organization and, and to strengthen the capacity of the community and also of intersex organizing globally, um, but most essentially in the global south. Thank you, Vida. Thank you, Crystal, for such an, a comprehensive answer. Uh, next question I would like to bring today is from Ernst, uh, working with the permanent representation of the Netherlands to the United Nations in Geneva, uh, who asked, has asked, uh, uh, well, he, uh, the person has said, I, am cu I, uh, I was curious on panelists' opinion on how you how we can engage on intersex with traditionally more conservative religious countries uh, and and Ernst uh, also mentioned uh well see uh, the person su suggests uh should we perhaps delink intersex from soji uh, and focus on the medical side in order to find some consensus with countries like Pakistan or Egypt. Uh, so if any panelists would feel comfortable in assuming the, in answering it, please go ahead. We are happy to hear from any one of you. Well, I believe James or Please go ahead, Crystal. You yeah, <laughs> thank you, um, and for that question, and <laughs> it's great to talk to you again. Um, I think like um, it, it's a really important question, and especially it's essential when we're talking about where people's lives are criminalized. 
Um, my um, personal point of view is that I do feel that the entire community, um, like when we are fighting for intersex rights, right, we need to ensure that the entire community is included because intersex people deal with being erased and being isolated from community and having their own identity as people question. Um, but also when we're looking at the traditional and religious and cultural practices, like it, it, it's very difficult, especially when it comes to sexual orientation and, and gender identity, especially where people's lives are criminalized. So for me, I feel like it's, it's a win-lose situation because I have seen um, within our region, especially within Africa, is that where people have actually separated the intersex identities um, from the SOGI, there's, you can see that there's been um, some engagement with government and there's been talks on policy reform and, and having policies in place and laws that protect intersex people. The, 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 the loose situation is that is that um, like everybody knows that being intersex is not a gender identity and therefore there are people within the intersex community that is lesbian, that is gay, that is bisexual. You will have intersex people that, that do identify as transgender as well. So if we are going to promote rights for intersex people, we should be promoting rights for all intersex people, right? And what we need to look at is like the Global North organization that's, that's funding this anti-gender and anti-LGBTI agenda in the, in the Global South because these people are organizing against us, they have funding, which means that they are being funding. And that is something that we that we really have to talk about. I think as intersex people, we have this notion of nothing about us. Intersex people being soggy, we will then be removing a big part of the intersex community that does identify in those identities. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Crystal. I will take another question from the chat. I am delighted by Abby Overheim um, question. Thank you for that, oh, Abby. Uh, Abby is asking about effective ways uh, that child can assist this cause. Uh, what child, intersex child could do uh to further advance the intersex intersex human rights intersex politics fafali i believe you are a professor a teacher right and also well working with um popular education so would you be comfortable in assuming that question thank you very much vida um when it comes to um a child and the advocating advocacy work. Um, I would say it would be best to start within your community. You find yourself start creating awareness and visibility by um, a way of educating people about what biological variations are and how these things can be sort of distinct from sexual orientation or gender identity. When you come from this angle, you are able to um, speak more to the issues of the biological sex characteristics, which are distinct and, and can happen to anybody. And the fact that if you are intersex, you can fall under any of the sexual orientations that are there and also the gender identity that comes with it. So as a child, when it comes to um, issues of intersex advocacy, you would have to focus mainly on visibility and awareness creation. Thank you. Thank you, Fafali. If any other, well, any other panelists would like to jump in and say a few words some, about any question you ha we had. Uh, James, I believe you were interested in asking a question. Is that right? Not really. I was. I will respond to Baby Musamba on other uh, question they have put across uh, uh, in direct message, considering oh. it's a multi-dimensional question. Okay, so sorry for my, my, my mistake. My apologies. So uh, in those last 20 minutes we have, I would like to proceed for a small round when uh, 
I, I would ask you to complete uh, uh, two sentences. Uh, I have asked um, uh, Latin American and Caribbean speakers, panelists, to also complete uh, the sentences. And I am excited by the opportunity to hear about your, uh, how you do the same, how you complete those phrases. Those phrases. And I would, uh, Fafali, first, uh, can you please uh, complete, we, the intersex people of the global south are, and we, the intersex people of the global south demand Please, I would be happy to, to hear your answer. We, the intersex people of the global south, are affirming that intersex people are real and we exist in all countries of Africa. We, the intersex people of the global south, want to call on human rights organizations and funders to engage with intersex organizations and support them in the struggle for visibility increase our capacity and build our knowledge and affirmation of our human rights. Thank you so much for Fali. James, could you please do the same? We, the intersex people of the Global South, who we are and what we want. James, uh, can you please uh, answer it? Or, well, I will get back to James just soon, please. First, uh, next, Obioma, could you please uh, complete these sentences with the intersex people from the Global South, who we are and what we demand? Okay. Um, we, the intersex people of the Global South, are resilient and are ready to demand that all our rights are given back to us. We, the intersex people of Global South, want an end to all the harmful practices that harm our body. We want recognition, we want visibility, and we want empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Obioma. Crystal, wh who we are and what we want, please go ahead. Perfect. Um we, the intersex people of the Global South, are a vibrant community, and in our diversity, we want to reclaim our autonomy. We, the intersex people of the Global South, want to ensure that intersex persons lead full and productive lives. Our goal is to help create a society where being intersex is not viewed as a disease, sickness, or abnormality, but rather a set of naturally occurring differences that make up human variety. We picture an inclusive, diverse global South where intersex people's human rights, bodily autonomy, and integrity are valued, safeguarded, and affirmed. An intersex person has power and control over decisions that have impact on their life, and the birth of an intersex child is celebrated just like any other birth. We strive to make our neighborhoods ones where intersex people can freely choose whether to have any medical procedures performed without being forced or coerced, a culture where intersex people are accepted as they are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal, for such beautiful words. Um, Mifaso Sakala from Zambia, who we are and what we, are, we want the intersex people from the Global South, please, Mifaso. Okay, so uh, we, the intersex people of the Global South, are affirming that we are real and we exist in all uh, parts of the world. We are human beings just like anybody else who needs their rights to be uh, uh, respected and to live uh, dignified just like anybody else. Okay. We, the intersex people of the Global South, want to demand uh, respect for the rights of uh, uh, intersex persons, to be able to live dignified lives just like anybody else, and also to have uh, the autonomy to choose what happens to our bodies without being coerced into unwanted surgeries and infancy. Thank you. Thank you, Mifa. Thank you, Mifa. So uh, next, I, I, I ask Ronnie, 
Uh, Ronnie, could you please complete the sentences with intersex people from the global south, from Zimbabwe, from the African region, who, who they are and what they demand? All right. Um, we, the intersex people of the global south, we are human beings, just like just as good as anyone else uh, who is not um, intersex, and we deserve our full set of rights. We de we deserve protection. We deserve recognition. We deserve to be acknowledged and to have access to everything. And we, the intersex people of the, the global south, want to be part of every process, and I mean every process that concerns human beings. We don't want to be invisualized. We want to be involved in everything. We want to contribute as much as we can, and we want to be acknowledged without reservations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie and uh, James, please go ahead. We, the intersex people of the Global South are human beings. We exist and we shall always be ourselves. We, the intersex people of the Global South want, want to be treated with dignity and our right and our human rights be acknowledged. Thank you so much, James. Thank you all the speakers for their presentations. Uh, I am sure it was really, really valuable for all of us. Uh, I thank you the kindness uh, of participating in that project. And I thank you all joining us here today. Uh, my sincere gratitude for your collaboration with that project. Um, before we, we end uh, the, the webinar, I'd like to proceed for just a few, a few, a few words. Uh, I want to share with you uh, that our discussion will be consolidated, compilated in a um, in a publication of articles, each panelist here today presented, uh, who, each panelist who presented here today uh, also produced an article. The six uh, essays uh, will be part of a memoir publication we will release just soon. Here are the front cover of the Latin American Caribbean edition and the Africa edition we hope to, to release soon. So please uh, join us in our social media and, and we will make sure you, you, you receive the news, this great news about this publication. Uh, here, here are our uh, social media, how you can find us on social media, uh, where we also will make available the memoir publication e and where you can, can also receive information about, about our future activities. Uh, here is also the mail address of the intersex program of GATE, where I am at your disposal, please don't hesitate to contact me. I will be happy to receive your communication. Uh, well, here is, uh, here is our web page to donate and to collaborate with our activities. As our panelists have mentioned, intersex um, movements and intersex groups work with very few resources available, relying majorly upon voluntary activism. So please, uh, your donation will be very, very helpful in order to GATE and the other partnering organizations keep doing the social change we so urgently need. Um, well, uh, just a last, uh, a last quick warning. Uh, uh, I will send this tomorrow by mail again, but uh, I am in, in advance I would be happy if one of my colleagues could share 
the link the URL for a questionnaire uh, of well monitoring and evaluation of this activity. Uh, I ask you the kindness to answer those questions. The this evaluation would will be really important to provide information, reliable information to guide our work uh, in the future here in GATE and to also um, provide information to a sustainability strategic plan for the intersex program. Uh, I hope to present the end of this year. So once again, thank you so much. Uh, well, all, all people joining here today, especially you, the speakers, the panel of speakers uh, on behalf of GATE and the Intersex Program, I am. I want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you. Uh, you are leaders um, who inspire, inspire us very much and for your work, for your, your activism uh, in, in favor of intersex communities in Africa, our Thank you. So to all my colleagues in GATE also, my, my thank you for all your collaboration and effort to execute this conference today. And to all of you part who participated in this conversation, thank, thank you very much for joining us in this occasion. I really hope to meet you very soon uh, in a, on some next occasion. Uh, and with much gratitude, I would like to say goodbye to all of you uh see you soon